He went to a cross. He went to a grave. He came out victorious. And he's the only one to come out of the grave alive. He's my Savior, the lover of my soul, my deliverer, my redeemer, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And no name is higher than his. That's powerful when we know this and understand it. That's who we are in him. Know whose you are. This word power is a powerful thing. The word power is broke down in the Greek. I'm even going to show you the numbers. It's G1411. That's the Greek Hebrew dictionary, numbers 1411. It's dunamis. Dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. Now, if we said it wrong, we all said it wrong, so that's good. This word dunamis, it's actually, dunamis is used nine different ways in Scripture. So it'll have a different word sometimes, but it means, but it's the same word, root word of dunamis, meaning mighty acts. I'll give you an example of that, a couple of them real quick here. Matthew 16, Jesus said, lead us not to, to, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, G1411. That's, everybody say dunamis. Amen. And the glory forever, amen. Here's another one. Um, uh, in Matthew, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Everybody say dunamis. But according to Scripture, these particular people are going to be told, Depart from me, I don't, I don't know you. And there's a difference. The difference is they were doing these wonderful works of their own power and in their own name, of their own strength. I, I don't know who you are. Another example, in Mark chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue, everybody say dunamis, it's 1411, had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? There's a moment in scripture where Jesus is moving through a crowd of people. And he's being pushed and pulled on by, we don't know how many, hundreds, maybe thousands of people in the street pushing and pulling on him. And somewhere along the way, he just stops and asks the question, who, who touched me? And of course, the disciples respond immediately, Master, Master, there's people everywhere. We're all getting pushed around. We're all getting shoved. What do you mean, who touched me? And Jesus said it like this. He said, someone has touched me, and I perceive that virtue, dunamis, is gone out of me. There was a woman who had an issue of blood. She had a disease, a sickness. And because of her particular disease, she was not legally allowed to be around men or crowds of people. She was supposed to be hidden away in her house because she was unholy and unclean. But she heard about this man named Jesus. She heard about the miracles he had performed. And so she breaks out of her house. She decides within herself, I am going to get to wherever he is. I'm going to push my way to whomever. And she took the risk of even being killed for breaking the law so that she could touch the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ. There was so much faith in her. That as she pushed her way through this crowd and, 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 and moved and dodged and weaved and tried to get to where he was, that the moment she touches him, he stops. She literally, because of her faith, pulled dunamis. Oh. Pulled power right out of him. And she didn't even touch his person. She just touched the thing laying upon his person. Woo. She didn't actually even touch his skin. She just touched what was resting upon who he is. And she touched it. And when she did, her faith was so strong, she received something that no one else had really received in Scripture up until that moment. And that was dunamis power from God right out of his own body. Yeah. Took it. I, I, sometimes get, I sometimes chuckle at myself and, and others sometimes. We get in this modern era we, you know, we, we, it's easier to whine about the problems than to have great faith to chase it out, to walk it out. 
It's easier to wait for somebody else to come along and convince us it's going to be okay and talk, than just to get up and start pushing through and start believing and start praying and start fasting, start knowing that God's going to do something. We have twisted the whole thing up. I'm telling somebody today, if you'll begin to trust God like you never have before and push through your issue, push through the problem, pray, fast, and seek, you're going to find yourself on the receiving end of some dunamis. Push through, push through. Now, can you imagine for a moment, there's no way that he did not know she was there. <laughs> there's no way he didn't know. Because why? He knows all things, right? And so in my mind, here's how I visualize that moment. This is just me. He's moving through the crowd. He's passed by her house. And in my mind, in his spirit, he's saying, she's getting closer. Oh, she's getting closer. She's almost there. And the moment she touches him, he stops everything. And why did he stop it? He asked the question, who touched me? Because I want to point out who had the faith. Oh. Everybody else is saying, touch me, touch me, touch me, touch me. And she said, no, I'll do whatever i got to do to touch you. If I can get to you, everything changes. If I get to you, my life will never be the same. Who are you? I've been healed by you. Woo. When someone tries to tell you to calm down, don't be so excited. Get more excited and get more happy. Why? Because God said, strive after me. Oh. And reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Push through. Quit just sitting around waiting for something to happen. Make something happen. See it before you see it. Speak it before it's there, even there. I've spent my life doing that. My wife and I raising our kids. Haven't you done that? Raising your kids. Lord, I'm speaking to him to be a mighty man of God. A mighty woman of God. Let them be preachers and ministers of your word. Let them be people that reach the lost, almighty God. You speak to what you can't see yet because it's your faith being activated. And that's called dunamis power. In Matthew, we see... It's incredible scripture by a man named John the Baptist. And by accident, the slide's in the wrong color, but just, it's not supposed to be in red, but it's just, it happens. Sometimes I just make mistakes. Hallelujah. <laughs> John the Baptist is saying, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost and with fire. John the Baptist went before Jesus, a precursor, preaching a message of repentance the entire time that Jesus was growing up into the man of 30 years of age. John the Baptist is the guy wearing the big woolly clothes. He's out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. And for years I thought locusts was bugs. And I thought, why would you eat bugs? And I'm hearing they want us to eat bugs now. Don't eat bugs. <laughs> Not doing it. Not going to do it. <laughs> um, don't eat bugs. But actually, it's, it's actually a fruit. It was a fruit he was eating, locusts. It was a type of fruit and honey. And so that's what he was always eating. And so, but, but he was separate from the world because he was preaching a message people didn't really want to hear. Repent! Repent! It's not, a, it's not a, like a, you know, boy, I went to church today and heard the most powerful message. Repent. Really, that was it? Yeah, repent. You know, if we ever learned the power of repentance, it would change our world. It would change the people around us. It would change us. What it means to repent. Pride, tribalism. Oh, come on. Uh, repent. But John the Baptist is preaching like this. Why is he preaching like this? Why does he have such an anointing on him to preach this gospel the way he's preaching it with such fervor and such power? Because there was a moment that took place. Now, for the theologians in the room, some might struggle with this. Figure it out. 
There was a moment when he was a baby in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. And Mary, who was carrying Jesus, the Savior of the world, in her belly, goes to meet her cousin, Elizabeth. And the Bible says when they got close to each other, oh, Lord Jesus, the baby inside of Elizabeth, which happens to be John the Baptist, the Scripture says he leapt in the womb. Something happened whenever Jesus got close to John. They weren't walking the earth. They're still in the womb. Understand what's in the womb, that is life. Protect the life. What's in the womb matters. And they get close, and John the Baptist, as an infant in the womb, leaps in the womb. Power hit him from a moment he was in the womb. Before he entered this earth, there was some anointing that God put on him to walk around and tell people, repent, repent, repent. The kingdom of God is coming. Repent, 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 repent. He preached the message. You don't preach that kind of message unless you got power in you. You don't preach that kind of message because you know you'll be alienated, separated from society. And yet, he did it. Why? Because something happened to him. Something changed him, even in the womb. Luke, Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, Behold, I give unto you power, dunamis, to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. What are serpents and scorpions? Well, I've met both of those things in real life. Some of y'all probably have too. I'm a fan of neither one. And I prefer having power over them than them having power over me. That's just a fact. I'm not a fan of snakes. I, my philosophy on snakes is a good snake is one that is dead. That's just me. <laughs> and there's reasons for that. I had some experiences as a young man dealing with snakes. I'll never forget in Brownwood, Texas, growing up there, I had a house on a hill. And we didn't know when we bought the house, the hill was called Rattlesnake Hill. I mean, should have done more research, I suppose. <laughs> My dad's house. And, and one night, I got to let the dog out the front door, and the front door is between two floors, right? So you got to... It had a little half step up, and then you got another half step. And so I go let the dog out. When I open the front door, I see a long stick laying across the ground. I was like, well, how'd that stick get here? It's midnight. It's dark. I can't see anything. And my little dog runs out the door. And when that dog ran across that threshold, that stick went, <laughs> set up, looked at me, and went, ugh. Well, I'm standing there in the doorway and threshold, four year, about five by five space, whatever it was. And this thing's flying at me. And I just went, Ugh! as fast as I could. I just wasn't quick enough. I caught three and a half feet of rattlesnake inside the house with the door. It was too big around to close the door. So I am doing something that looks like this. I am holding a door while a snake is between my legs. I, I did dance moves that, <laughs> and I don't dance. If anyone ever could copy those moves, they'd be, they'd be a millionaire. I'm just saying, it was, it was amazing what I accomplished in those few moments. I'm screaming. My mom's screaming, get the gun. I'm going, don't get the gun. There's no way you're hitting that thing <laughs> with all of this in the way. <laughs> My dad yells for a knife and a rake. My brother who goes to his room, he's got a knife collection at this time, probably about 75 knives on the wall. It took him forever. Which one would be the best knife cut snake? Snake cutting knife. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Finally, the snake gets pinned down with a rake. My dad cuts his head off. And did you know that for two and a half hours, that head stayed on the ground snapping like this? And if you got close enough, he still could kill you. That's a rattlesnake. 
But this scripture is not speaking directly to talking about scorpions on the ground and serpents on the ground. It's talking about demonic things. Demonic things. Things that are spiritual things. Believe me, this world is full of serpents. And when I say serpents, I'm talking about serpents that will try to destroy your life, destroy your family, destroy your home, lie to you, whisper to you, attack you, lie about you. Those are snakes and serpents. Snakes and serpents. Scorpions have a sting. They got a sting that you feel for a long time. It's a demonic thing. He says, I'm giving you power to walk over mess. When cancer tries to come into your body and the doctor says there's no other hope, he says, I'm giving you some power right now to step on a scorpion, to walk in healing, and to see something happen. This dunamis, this power is more than we realize. It's a powerful thing in our life. Romans 1 and 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power, dunamis, of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power of God. I am not ashamed. It's a powerful thing when you talk about this dunamis from who he is. What that woman touched when she touched the hem of his garment, this power, this it's an indescribable thing. Revelation chapter 1 gives us another vision of Christ. I know we all have a vision of Christ. We see him a lot on the cross. You know, we see that. I'm not, I'm not against that image, but it's not his final image. It was one of his images, but not the final one because he came out of a grave. Remember that moment? And he walked this earth. Over 500 people saw him after his resurrection. But here's a moment right here. Revelation 1 gives us another picture of who Jesus is. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His eyes were like flames of fire. That word fire, from the, from the uh, Greek word pur, pur, actually, meaning specifically lightning. Lightning. Flames, the word flames, actually means flash. When Revelation describes Jesus' face, and you look at his face, the white hair like wool, and you see into his eyes, it is flashes of lightning that you see. When Jesus said it in Scripture, when he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, he's simply telling us that with one look from his eye, he cast Lucifer out of the heavenlies and put him on the earth. The power that resides in God is hard to describe. And the writer could only describe it as lightning flashing in his eyes. I want you to hang on to that vision just for a few moments. You see, the Holy Ghost is a powerful thing in your life. It changes everything about you. It, it, it never gets old. I've had the Holy Ghost since I was six years old. I'll never forget the night. I'll never forget what happened that night. I remember everything very vividly. It's one night, as a, at young of an age, I can recall the whole evening. Okay, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> six years old, front row, actually second row, and uh, my dad was preaching revival in a little town called Nebo, Louisiana. Don't go there, nothing there, nothing to see. He's preaching revival. All I know, I saw kids getting up and going to the altar and praying. I'm on the second row. I start weeping. Next thing I know, I feel a hand on my head. And I look up and I see my dad on the row in front of me, standing on the row, going, go ahead, boy. Let God move. He's praying for me. And I put my hands in there and I begin to speak in tongues at six years of age. They put me in the baptist baptistry to baptize me that night. And they put me in a red one-piece jumper type thing. I don't know what it was. Like an overall type of thing. But I was so little that they had to put a chair in the baptistry so I could stand on it and get baptized. My dad's so proud. His son just got the Holy Ghost. He's going to baptize me right now. And he gets in the water with me and he puts me under the water. And when he goes under, I slip off the chair and go to the bottom of the tub. He just, I just slid right through his arms. Next thing I know, something grabs me right about here and picks me up upside down out of that water. And I come out of that water speaking in the whole time. I'll never forget it as long as I live. The power of God in your life, even at the age of six, 
and now I'm 50 years old. It's never gotten old. It's never gotten to where I don't need it. It's been stronger and stronger in my life every single day. What is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost moves at the speed of lightning. And I'm, that's the best I can guess. It's way faster than that, but it's the closest understanding. When we're talking about lightning in his eyes, what is the speed of lightning? 670, 670 million miles an hour. That means when I, when I pray for someone in Pakistan from right here, my prayer from here hits Pakistan in less than eight seconds. Oh, I don't know if y'all are still with me or not. I don't know. When you're operating in power, when you're operating in the Holy Ghost, when you're operating in dunamis, you are operating in a way that normal people cannot operate in. As a matter of fact, we're going to take a moment. We have dear friends in Pakistan. You know them. The church, most of the church knows them. You'll see them here again soon. i got pictures of stuff I'm going to show you next week to let you know what, more of what's happening. But this church partnered with the ministry in Pakistan. They've come here. We've been there. We've been in their home. We stayed with them. We know who they are. We've been a week with them there. This church has set slaves free from Pakistan. Sometimes it costs $3,000 per family to set them free from the brick kilns. I walked in the brick kilns. I saw them for myself. I saw the conditions. It's, the, it's unthinkably horrible. I ain't got time to explain to you why they're slaves and how they got there. But here's what I'll tell you this. This church paid for eight families to be set free. You did that. You did that. But here's the problem. Because a church like ours and other churches who've been going into Pakistan and helping set people free, because when we set them free, from the, we pay their debt to get them out of the brick kiln, then they get put into a halfway house where they get job training so they can go out and do something. And so it's, it's a whole process, but we've been doing it for so many years now that the brick kiln owners and the locals now have turned on the Christians. Just this past week, a mob of Muslims burned down 24 churches in one area, one city. And then burned down a thousand homes, the Christians that went to those churches. The Christians were hiding in a field. And my friend, John, uh, John and Rachel A.D., uh, were there and spent $10,000 feeding people in a field. They lost everything. They're going after the Christians now. It's getting so dangerous there now that we are working right now with that family to get his mother and father into the states so we can save them from that situation. In the next year or so, maybe sooner, I don't know how long it's going to take. We're, it's a pro, I don't know, maybe months, maybe weeks. But you're going to meet some more people from Pakistan because they'll be here at some phase as this church steps up to help get somebody out of the way of death and threat. I'll be telling you more about that and you'll be able to partner with us to make it happen. But real persecution is happening around the world. 90% of all Christians martyred today are martyred in Pakistan and Nigeria. We've been to Pakistan. We're going to Nigeria in the end of September. It's important to reach the souls. Come on, somebody. And when we go, I'm believing God for miracle after miracle after miracle for dunamis power, the Holy Ghost, to wreck that place and see something awesome happen. I'll tell you more about that next week so you have fully aware of what's going on. And when he had said so, he showed up to them in his hands. He showed him his hands and his side, the wounds in his hand and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And then Jesus said, and all of a sudden, received the Holy Ghost. Nothing happened at that moment, but he was giving them an understanding of what was coming. Receive you the Holy Ghost. When he breathed on them, that word breath uh, from the word pano or noe, meaning to breathe, a breeze, a breath of wind. The word ghost, receive the Holy Ghost, meaning a current of air. That is a breath. When the Holy Ghost moves into your life, it is the breath of God. Oh, come on. Like he did in the beginning when, when he formed the man, Adam, from the dust of the ground. What did he do? He breathed life into him. When you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you are receiving the breath of God into your life. Know what it is. 
It is powerful. And I've had people say, well, I don't know. Can I, can I live with the Lord for the Lord but not have the Holy Ghost? I don't like that exciting stuff. It's too much. It's too much. Let me tell you something. You need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. That's just, just a reality of the day. I need the Holy Ghost to get up in the morning. I need the Holy Ghost to go about my day. Don't ever deny a gift from a God that loves you. Take what God is giving you and receive it with joy. It'll change your life. It'll change your life. And here we go to the moment when it happened. He said what well, he breathed on him. And then suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. On the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon mankind, that first moment when it happened the very first time, the 120 in the upper room began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance, and there was cloven tongues of fire that rested upon them. What is cloven tongues of fire? Cloven tongues of fire is this word again, poor, meaning lightning. The lightning in his eyes was the same lightning that set upon their head, cloven tongue with an arc in the middle. We're talking about the electricity, the electricity of who he is. Lightning from him and breath from him. Power and breath breathed into his people and they begin to speak in other tongues. What did that mean? When they begin to speak in other tongues, there were people on the street below from all parts and all regions around the world for that, that ceremony, that uh, festival at that time, the day of Pentecost, the Pentecost fest feast, and they're all there and they're all hearing these Jews who cannot speak their language and they're speaking multiple languages and people are receiving the word of God from these Jews up in this room they have fire on them. I, I, I know for those who have received the Holy Ghost, did it not feel like you got shocked by something? Ooh, my God, have mercy. That's why when you see somebody work, they go, oh, you know, oh, God, have mercy. Did you feel that? I felt that too. You see, it's a little, it's a, ah. Oh, don't look at me funny. I've seen you too. <laughs> it's electrical, it's powerful. It is the breath of God. It's what's in his eyes. It's the power that casts out Lucifer. That's why he says, I give you authority over demons in my name. When we walk in his name and have authority over demons, we can speak to demons. Loose yourself from this place and flee away from this place in the name of Jesus by the power of God in me. That's why it's like that. Fire. Fire. As a matter of fact, the people looking up at the upper room, hearing the different languages, they begin to say, these people are drunk. they got to be drunk. But Peter stands up with the eleven, lifted his voice, and said, you men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to my words. These men are not drunken as ye suppose. What was he talking about? Back in that time, there were prophetesses, prophets, priests, priestesses, whatever the word is for that, that would conjure up spells to give you a fortune. They would do this late at night, midnight to 3 a.m. range, usually in a darkened area, a cave, an isolated place, and they'd be in there with a fire. They'd have the sense of the cave around them. They'd be drinking alcohol and putting themselves into a demonic trance. And they would be drunk, and the people would go in to get their word. And the spirit in the person, in the drunken person, would, would give them a prophecy, a fortune, a prophetic word. And so when the people on the street saw this happening, they assumed that must be like those people, except it's 9 o'clock in the morning. There's something different about what I'm seeing. The people that give us these other words, they're in these spooky caves, and they got these weird mixtures of stuff everywhere, and candles, and, 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 and this is, this is, and Peter says, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. 
We don't do that mess around here. That's not who we are. In other words, God brought the power that is greater than the, than the prophetic demonic voices that they were used to listening to. And in, Lord, in some cases, those voices still exist in modern day churches. Especially from people who will just go there to get a word. Give me a prophetic word. Tell me my fortune. Tell me my future. You still with me, church? But what God poured out supersedes the filth of the demonic mess. He says, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk as you suppose. But he goes on to say this. But be it known unto you, these are not drunk. This is the third hour of the day. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. This is not that midnight demonic mess. This is something from God. And when he said that, he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit, that pneuma, that breath, upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. If 2,000 years ago was the last days, what are these? I believe we're living the last of the last of days. I will tell you more about that another time. There's a lot of stuff coming down the road, but we are living the last of days, and God wants to pour out his spirit upon his people like he's never done before, that even your children begin to prophesy under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They speak to demonic things and cast them out. They walk with favor and anointing. They walk like children of God, and they're not taken out by demonic forces around this country. God is pouring out his spirit for his people. And he wants to put it, he wants you to receive what he's giving. This is that. In other words, what you're seeing right now was spoken in the Old Testament by the prophet Joel. That's what you're seeing right now. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said this. He repeated John the Baptist, repent. He took it all the way back to the beginning again. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you, unto your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He said, repent. And be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many here have the Holy Spirit? You know, you know you got it. Raise your hand. How many here want it? Raise your hand. It's okay. Oh, good, 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 good. It's gonna to happen today. Today. He said, you're going you're gonna to receive it today. You're going to receive it right now. He said, it's going to happen. Repent. How do I start? Repent. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me my mind, my heart. Wrongful words, wrongful actions, wrongful deeds. God, bless me. Fill me with your spirit. Get baptized and get ready. It's going to happen. We've prayed with people before. We've, we, they've come to the altar and they went, I want to receive this. And they, I said, okay, great. We prayed. Nothing really happened. I said, let me tell you something. God can do this whenever he wants to. It's his business. No one can give it to you. That's God's business. I can't give it to you, but God does. And I've told people, you're going to go home tonight, you're going to get the Holy Ghost tonight when you go home. I've had so many phone calls over the years. Pastor, you will not believe this. I got home last night, went to lay down, and next thing I know, I'm laying there crying and weeping and talking in tongues. I got the Holy Ghost when I got home last night. Of course. God gives to his people. It's not something you can't have. It's for all of us. Now, I know, I know, a lot of bigger Larger churches don't like talking about the Holy Ghost because they can't control it. Hmm. It's just easier to talk about money and God going to bless you today. Did I say too much? Did I say too much? Just making sure. Hallelujah. We all having fun yet? We're almost done. We're almost done. 
I have, I have some more about this. It wasn't, and I'll, I'll close it like this. It wasn't even the, it wasn't just the apostles that received. I got four or five different verses here talking about everyone that received the Holy Ghost that were not disciples or apostles. After that moment, Samaritans received it. Paul, Peter shows up and begins to preach. They start speaking in tongues. And next thing you know, they go, and even the disciples that came with him, these, the, the, the circumcised ones, the ones that, you know, all the stuff, they're going, they got the Holy Ghost like we did. That's us, Gent we're the Gentiles, just so you know, you're the Gentile, and I'm a Gentile. And they received. It wasn't, because I know some people like, it's just for the disciples. It's just for, no, it's for everybody. Multiple locations, five different places in Scripture where people that were not disciples receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. By the dozens at a time. And it's still happening this very day. Right now, it's still happening. God is doing something big in our lives, and I don't want you to miss out on it. Your life will be changed. The Holy Ghost fell on each one of them. House of Simeon, House of Simon, Holy Ghost fell on them again. But I want, I want to point this thing out to you. Before lightning can strike, before the Holy Ghost can fall, there has to be someone. The static charge is felt by all those in the area on the ground. Lightning goes where it's wanted. There has to be a pull from the ground for lightning to strike. Oh, lightning doesn't just land somewhere spontaneously. It goes at the greatest point of pull. It's attracted to the greatest point of grounding. And everyone in the area, when lightning goes to hit that space, hits that space, everyone feels the static electricity bill where they're standing. And then it hits. What does that mean to me? That tells me that his presence, his spirit, his glory, the lightning from his eyes and the breath from his mouth goes where it's wanted and desired. It fills those who say, Lord, fill me. And there's a pull. Oh, oh, you're still with me. There's a pool of God's glory. Lord, I want to see something. God, I want to feel your presence. Lord, I want to experience your glory. And we begin to call out and say, Lord, we need a healing right here. We need deliverance right here. And we begin to call out and preach it by faith and say it by faith. And God releases it to the place that people want to receive it. It happened on day of Pentecost that way. They were there for a period of days waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting because they were prepared for something to happen. Church, if you want to experience something moving in your life, start pulling on it from God. Like the little woman walking through the crowd, she pushed her way through and reached out and touched. She pulled from his presence, and he responded and gave her what she needed. When we get in the church, that's why it's so powerful. Where two or three are gathered together, when there's more than even that, all piled up in there saying, Lord God, we want a miracle. Lord God, pour out your spirit. Lord, there's a pull that happens, and something takes place. That's why you see mighty things happen. When the body's gathered together, there's a greater pool. I want to read to you one last thing as I close this out. This is not my third close. This is the final closing. God showed me a vision in 2011. And I want to read it to you today. And it's on the church app. If you, have, if you download the church app, it's easy to go to your app store, download it. It's right there on the church app. Look down it. And it says the great outpouring. Tap on it. You'll read this very thing. But I'm telling you about it now because I want you to see how God does things. In 2011, God showed me this vision. I wanted to find out after I shared this vision, similar vision like I said, we have given even back 30, 20, 30 years ago. So now knowing, I didn't know about those visions. God showed me for me. Here's how it goes. The way the vision happened in my mind, it was like a reporter that was telling a story and the, and the reporter was relaying what was taking place. He said, they call the event the great outpouring. And since then, it's been reported through every major news network around the world. I thought that I would try to give a little more insight as to what has taken place and where it began. It all began during a church service at Central Triad Church where there was a deep presence of repentance mixed with great expectation of the miraculous. Pulling. It is said that the mission statement of the church is to transform lives, produce disciples, and impact the world. During the service, what was described as a powerful move of God began to pour into the building. 
One of the church members says that it felt like waterfalls in the spirit. Another said it felt like waves of the ocean. One wave would hit, then another and another. You could no longer stand in the building. A guest of the service said they had never seen anything like it before. People were speaking in tongues, praising God, while others were lying on the floors that they had passed out. So the reporter who's talking about this in my vision lifted, so I lifted my hands and felt something indescribable. It wasn't until several hours later that I realized I had been walking around the building. My family was shocked at my behavior, for you see, I was a paraplegic and had been wheelchair bound my entire life. The outpouring fell so hard that and mightily that the building couldn't contain the atmosphere. There's a highway nearby called 311 Bypass, also known as 74. One of the drivers on the road that day said it looked like a cloud was hovering over Central Triad Church and the highway. As we passed through it, my seven-year-old son began to scream out, I can see, I can see. I pulled the car over and began praising God because my son had been blind since birth. It took over a week to clear the traffic jam, traffic jam off the highway because people just left their cars and were laying on the ground between the highway and the church. This outpouring has been going on for several years now and shows no signs of slowing down. The church is located at 2935 Cole Road has multiple campuses around the world along with daily services taking place in buildings, homes, offices, parks, and stadiums. Churches across the globe are also breaking out in this outpouring. Millions have been affected by it and now they claim they're listening for the sound of a trumpet. It was a vision God gave me. Now, you might think, well, Pastor, that's just crazy. That's just too much. I've had a lot of visions in my life, and I've seen a lot of visions come to, come to fruition, completely seen it come to pass. And when God gave me this vision, I, I need you to know something that's kind of cool, and that is, hey, Dennis, take it from me, would you? Back when I got that vision in 2011, you couldn't even see the highway from this church. But what happened when y'all drove to church today? For the first time ever, the trees that blocked the vision from the highway to the church are all being cut down. The exit from the highway that's going to come up literally right behind our building right here, the new exit. They're going to raise the exit to be the same height as basically our parking lot. You will literally walk out the back of this building and walk right over to the highway if you want to and begin to be on the exit. That didn't exist in 2011. But right now it's happening. And what I, oh, I don't know if you're with me yet, but I, you got to see it before you see it. You got to see it before you see it. You got to know that God is moving. You got to know that God is moving and see it. Then you will see it. Woo! Oh, that's too much. That's too much. It's not enough. We need more people seeing the bigger thing. More people seeing the outpouring. More people getting ready for revival. Because I fully believe the days don't come very soon. Because they're telling me within two years that road will be built and finished. And you'll be, whew, Lord Jesus. I can already see it happening in services. I've got plans to put big LED walls on the side of the building so everybody that drives by sees who's getting the Holy Ghost in the house over here. I've already, I'm telling you, something is breaking loose and it's happening now. It's time, it's time, it's time. You need to get a vision for your future, for your family. Let the Holy Ghost lead you and believe what God is releasing in your life and trusting for it. A vision of healing, deliverance, salvation in your family. You may have lost loved ones. Start seeing them saved. And you watch God put conviction in their heart and begin to turn them around, turn them around to the kingdom of God. Church of the living God, we are on the edge of the most powerful move of God that we have been praying about for our whole lives. And we will see it happen right here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, across this nation and across this world as people that are drug addicts, living horrible lives, 
porn addicts, go down the list, add an addict to it, going to walk in and be set free and delivered in moments and moments and moments. And find joy and peace and happiness. Salvation. Strength. Anointing. But you got to start receiving it. When God begins to breathe over your life, don't reject it. Don't say, Lord, I don't, I don't think I need that right now. I like it like I like it like I like it. No. No, you're telling God, you're becoming your own God when you do that. To reject the gift from God. This is an opportunity for your life to be changed. And I hope, I know, I always take the risk when I preach, people get uh, worked up about it. I, I understand it because the Bible gets people aggravated. I get that. But I hope if what you heard today, you, you have more questions, come ask me. Come ask some of our prayer team. They, they, every one of them can tell you about it. It's for you. It's for your children. Don't you want to see your children prophesy in the Spirit of God? Yeah. Let's stand together. Whew. I fixed to ask the prayer team to come down in just a moment and we're gonna have a time of prayer and then we'll have a time of fun outside. <sighs> but before we leave this place, I want some people in this house that if you want to receive, let's say you need healing in your life, I want you to come down for prayer. Let me start over. If you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to maybe get a fresh start in Him, repent, start over. If you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you need healing or deliverance from your family, whatever it may be, if you want to be baptized, we're ready to baptize you today. There's five major reasons. When the prayer team comes down and I finish praying for you, I'm telling you, don't watch, run. The hungry get fed. Those that pull will receive. Those that long for will receive. Let me tell you a cool testimony real quick. The, we do a broadcast. And I want to tell all of our media team is working so hard. Sound people in the back rooms, other parts of the building, audio team in the building here, lights, camera operators. I want to tell you what God does. We had an a, a open house this past Sunday. We have a, a Thursday. We have a school here at this church, a, a homeschool home co-op, 350 some odd students. It's really impressive. And, and this past Thursday, I had a, a, a lady come through the building, and she saw me and my wife, and she said, I want you to know this place has changed my life, and she's never come to church here except to bring her kid to school. And I said, she said, what do you mean? She said, well, I wasn't a Christian when I started bringing my child to this school two years ago, three years ago. She said, but I wanted to, after being here a few times, I thought I should get to know more about this church. She said, I've been watching your videos online. And she said, it's changed my life. And I'll be registering to get baptized here next week. <laughs> Woohoo! I mean, that's just, that's what God does. So I don't know what you need to see happen. It can happen right now. You need healing in your family? It can happen right now. You want to see the Holy Ghost? It can happen right now. You want deliverance? It can happen right now. You need salvation? It's going to happen right now. When I finish praying, don't wait. Grab your family, whatever you want to do. Come to the front. This team will be waiting to pray with you. Are you ready? Right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for the abundant life that we get to live in the power of the Holy Ghost. That comforter that sticks closer than a brother. That breath of God, that lightning from the eyes of God, that power that fills us so powerfully. Reminds us who we are in you and what you desire for us. Lord, I'm asking right now in this room that every person can receive from you right now. Joy, salvation, joy, peace, strength, healing, the infilling of your spirit. If there's broken marriages here today, God, I'm asking for healing in those marriages. Lost loved ones, God, I'm asking for the lost loved ones to be turned towards God. We will see them return. Lord, let this be a life-changing moment right now that somebody's about to get healed. Somebody's about to be delivered. Somebody, somebody's about to be filled.
right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And somebody says, amen.